intimate. That's the nothing personal word of the day. It is Friday, April 5th, 2024. Intimate. That's the word that's being used to describe the new stadium where the Oakland A's will play for the next three years. Well, it's not exactly a new stadium. It's 25 years old. We don't exactly know if they'll play for three years, but they may. And oh, by the way, it's in Sacramento. A lot went on. And that's why it's my top story today. Because for the life of me, as Coke and I were talking about this show, thinking about, can we talk A's again? The answer is, of course, only if something bizarre happens during this announcement. Because I had said, you know, Sacramento really is where the interim is going to happen. The whole A's negotiation with Oakland was a absolute red herring. Whether Oakland, the city of Oakland changed to 20 million a year instead of 30 million a year for, for rent payments, it really didn't matter a bit. There was very little chance that the Coliseum was going to house the athletics for three more years. Sacramento is a perfect other than for the fans of Oakland and other than for Oakland staying in Oakland, which I still think is possible, by the way. Sacramento is a better interim solution. They were never going to share a stadium with the San Francisco Giants. It just, you can't have two teams sharing a, ball, a ballpark. It doesn't work. I mean, two major league teams. So the A's and MLB had plenty of time to figure out the announcement of the deal in Sacramento. Plenty of time to figure out what the talking points were specifically going to be. And plenty of time to talk to the union about this interim situation. And the reason why the union is so important here is the union has to agree to this. There is no deal in Sacramento without union agreement. I want to be as clear as I can be about that statement. The union will absolutely agree, but without it, there's no deal. It is way easier when you are announcing something that you know is going to be difficult. You know that there's a possibility of vitriol coming your way. You know the background that led to this sort of interim announcement. So you really want to try to get it right. So John Fisher shows up in Sacramento. He does a press conference. He does it with Dave Cavill as president. And he does it, of course, with the owner, of course, the owner of the Sacramento Kings. Now, why do I say, of course? Because Vivek, the owner of the Sacramento Kings, is an important person in this story because he owns the AAA team called the Sacramento River Cats who are now going to be sharing their stadium and becoming the beneficiary of improvements that will be made in this stadium. None for the fans, all for the players. Now, a AAA ballpark, 10,000 seats, some standing room, some sitting room, say 14,000 people. The Oakland Coliseum sits about 69,000 people. Now, of course, I can't remember the exact capacity because it hasn't been an issue for so long, but just pretend that you can picture a football stadium where there used to be a football team. Just think pro player stadium in Florida. Just think any football stadium. It's big. And when there's 3,000 people there, it doesn't look great. When there's 10,000 people, not perfect. You can tarp the upper deck. You can close the upper deck. You can move everyone into certain sections between the bases. There's a lot you can do to make it look better on different TV angles, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of empty seats. And Oakland Coliseum was also famous. We used to, when we would go play in Oakland, one of the things we made sure during BP is that we were paying very close attention that we would not assume that any ball in the air is ever going to go foul. Just assume that it is playable because there was so much territory in this particular ballpark. So we just had to remind the players because there's some ballparks where the foul territory is like two feet. So when it's in the air and it's, if you're playing third base, hey, any foul ball to your right, it's going to be foul. In Oakland Coliseum, any fly ball to your right, you have a pretty good chance to catch it. So intimate is a word 
that we use socially, you know what intimate is, intimacy, intimate in baseball. What does that mean? That's sort of a small gathering. It doesn't mean that it's a bad gathering. It doesn't mean it's not loud. It doesn't mean it's not a home field advantage. It's not a pejorative word. But intimate is a word that you rarely use in baseball. Except for premium seats. So when we're marketing seats right behind the dugout, special clubs, special clubs on the suite level, you say you will have an intimate, a personal experience. You will get to see the players come back and forth from the clubhouse because we put glass walls that are one way so they don't see you, but you can see them. I, I'm looking back on doing that at Marlins Park, and that's so sort of animal-like. I don't know why we did that. But to create an intimate atmosphere so you can increase the prices. But you wouldn't really call your entire ballpark intimate, even with a small capacity of 38,000 or 37,000, you would use, you would try to use words that are a little more descriptive of how loud, what the ruach will be, what the spirit will be. But John Fisher wanted to focus on intimacy. So he said, it's the most intimate park in Major League Baseball. Now, obviously, no one else in Major League Baseball plays in a minor league ballpark. So that's by definition. You could say we're excited and we're okay with the fact that it's a smaller capacity, that it's a minor league capacity, because it will be fantastic for the players to play in front of a sold out crowd every day. That would be a way better way to say it, that it's so small that it will be sold out every day. Of course, they don't know it, but that would have been a good thing to say. But then John Fisher says in his remarks, and keep in mind, the owner doesn't give remarks very often. And people get on him terribly, but I am not one of them. It is not necessary for the owner to ever speak publicly as far as I'm concerned. He said, we can't wait to watch the athletics players and MLB's top stars like Aaron Judge hit home runs there. Coca sent me that quote, and I assumed it was wrong because there is no scenario under which you ever talk about any opposing player ever doing anything good in your ballpark except during a home run derby associated with an all-star game. Other than that, you do not do anything to upset your own pitching staff, your own pitching coach, your own manager, your own players. That's what he wants you to be excited about. Now, I like mentioning opponents as a way to sell tickets, but I mention opponents in a way, hey, 2024 is going to be an exciting season or 2025 or 2012, pick your year. We're looking forward to the Yankees coming to town so we have an opportunity to beat them or so that our fans have an opportunity to see all of the best players in the sport. Great. There's a big difference between saying you're going to see a player and you're going to watch the player with excitement with your intimate ballpark that they will hit home runs against you. Then, of course, he did a statement, a lot of statements. He said, we explored several locations for a temporary home, including the Oakland Coliseum. Part of a statement to me, if you're not going to tell us something we don't know, then there's really no reason to give the statement. You already confirmed you met with the Oakland Coliseum. You don't need to say it again because all you're doing is asking me to point out that that meeting was a sham. But I digress. And then he couldn't help himself, even with the long-standing relationship and good intentions on all sides in the negotiations, the conditions to achieve an agreement seemed out of reach. In order to have good intentions in a negotiation, you have to be willing to complete the negotiation. If you're not willing to complete the negotiation, you don't have good intentions. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. There's plenty of people who enter into a negotiation who don't want to finish it. And that's not a good intention. It may be a good business move, but don't say that you entered into negotiation and you had the meetings with good intentions. But then you had 
the president come up. Now, my job as president was always to clean up whatever mess the owner made, if there were had been a mess, to try to clarify anything that our PR people said, oh, we're going to have to address the following three issues because the statement didn't do it, the release didn't do it, and I'm hearing questions about this. In your remarks, please make sure that you clear things up. But we'd also make sure that I had a list of things. Hey, don't talk about X, Y, and Z. And even if you don't have to clear things up, make sure you mention A, B, and C. So Dave Cavill comes out and says, it's an interim situation. And we felt it was best to play as the athletics in this period of our history. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about the fact that people needed clarity. Is it going to be the Sacramento A's? Is it going to be the Oakland A's? Is it going to be Las Vegas A's? And you may have heard us talk yesterday. I can't remember what show. I'm sorry. I think it may have been nothing personal, though it could have been on Rich's show, where we talked about that they would only call it the A's or the athletics because they don't want to rebrand as Sacramento A's when it's interim. And they don't want Vegas to think that, hey, Sacramento may be more than interim, which it may be. They don't want Oakland to think, oh, that's really it for Oakland. They don't want Oakland to have the benefit of, hey, it's the Oakland A's. So we can't keep them as the Oakland A's because we're not in Oakland. And we certainly can call them the Las Vegas A's because A, we're not in Las Vegas. We're not ready to start being Las Vegas, because we're going to do a full rebrand, new uniforms, new colors, a likely new logo. We can't do that. And so you just call them the A's. That seems totally normal. But the interim situation part was fascinating, that that's what baseball and the A's wanted to make sure that you were all clear about. Three years interim. Didn't talk much about the fourth year option. Fourth year option is if the Vegas ballpark or Oakland ballpark or any ballpark anywhere is not ready for 2028, which of course is possible. But then we got to the number one, number one, which is hard to imagine when you have Fisher and Cavill talking. Now I will admit, I haven't heard Vivek speak very much. I know he owns the Kings. I know the Kings are competing. I think they're down in the playing tournament now after a loss, but they're going to have a chance to make the playoffs. And Vivek, Vivek was an important part of this equation because A, he had to give permission as owner of the team, but B, they want him to be helpful as it relates to revenue, corporate sales, the relationship with the Kings, including the possibility of economies of scale with ticket sales, stadium operations, all sorts of things that in theory, the A's could save money on the operation of their team. But then Vivek said something and Coke, I don't know if we can pull that up, but if we can, the quote was, believe it or not, this is going to be the best ticket in major league baseball because it's an intimate stadium, small and intimate. It's like being in the lower bowl in a basketball game. So imagine that Otani is there and it's a small, intimate stadium. Stop mentioning opposing teams players. But anyway, so it's going to be the most sought after ticket in America. Vivek, can we uh, stop with hyperbole? It's clearly not going to be that. That's the women's final four. The longer term play is that I've been having conversations with Rob Manford. They're introducing two new franchises, one in the West, one in the East. And I think we're really in pole position to get the one in the West. So this is a showcase. I looked at that and said, wow, they just announced the death of Muhammad Ali. There is no way that Rob Manfred and Major League Baseball wanted expansion to be verified through the mouth of the owner of the Sacramento Kings and the AAA team in Sacramento called the River Cats. There is no way they wanted to confirm a team in the West and the East, even though we've confirmed it. There is no way that they wanted him to address this in any possible way. So here's what baseball likely wanted V Vec to say, and what I assumed would have been the easiest thing to say. We are thrilled to host this team 
for whether it's three years, four years, until they've got a major league ballpark. We are excited for the improvements that will exist for our AAA team. And I am also excited for the city of Sacramento for them to have Major League Baseball on a consistent basis because, hey, with expansion as a possibility, you never know. That would have been a much easier comment. And the last one is Rob Manfred. Rob, it's nice of you to express your appreciation to West Sacramento, to Sutter Health Park, that's the name, to the greater Sacramento region, to the Kings, for their excitement to host the A's for interim play. And then you finished your statement with, as the A's new permanent home is built in Las Vegas. That is a perfect commissioner's comment, but Selig would have done it. Anyone would have done that. You had to put it in, but I also have to point out that you don't know that. Nobody knows that. The permanent home in Vegas is not being built today. There is no agreement to build a permanent home in Vegas. There is nothing that connects the fact that they're moving to Sacramento as an interim period before going to Vegas. It's totally unrelated stories. The reason, of course, that Rob puts that into his statement is that he wants Vegas to have its feet to the fire as though if they're called out publicly that that will all of a sudden get Bally's to hurry up and get agreements and get the A's to hurry up and get agreements. The whole thing continues, in my opinion, what has been a very, and for me to call it this is something, a very clumsy relocation. Somehow, not the clumsiest thing from yesterday was the A's announcement that they're going to Sacramento. Somehow, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the team who in theory has still has the best odds to win the World Series, they continue to step in it in ways, and I've known Andrew and Stan and all those people for so long, it's got to make them crazy, doesn't it? They are so buttoned up and they want everything to always go so smoothly that it blows my mind that they have PR problems the way they do. And I'm talking about Shohei Otani, but I'm not talking about gambling. I'm talking about something that I have intimate knowledge of. And that is what to do when a fan catches a home run ball that you want to get back for the player. I had... And I've told this story before, one of the greatest examples of that when Ken Griffey hit his 600th home run at our ballpark, and I negotiated with the man who caught the ball trying to get it back for Ken Griffey. So I know exactly what happens after someone catches a ball. In Dodger Stadium, for whatever reason, what happens everywhere else, and I'm certainly not saying what I did is out of the ordinary. It's not. It's standard, but for whatever reason, the Los Angeles Dodgers seem to do things differently than everybody else. If you're to believe both Ambar Roman and her husband, Alexis Valenzuela. So the story is that Ambar Roman caught the ball. It was Otani's first home run as a Dodger. In theory, that makes the ball important to Otani. There are some who thought on the internet that ball is worth seven figures. It is not. The Athletic reported it's worth six figures. Darren Ravel will have teased a new company in dealing with memorabilia. Memorabilia is such a huge, huge, huge business now that it's pretty easy for people to calculate what a piece of memorabilia is worth. The thought is maybe closer to $100,000. Either way, it's like catching the way I used to describe certain things that people get in the stands. You can come to a game and you can pay for your kid's college because you just never know what you're going to get because the rule in baseball is very simple. If it's in the stands, it's yours. If a player's glove falls in the stands, you don't have to give it back. It's not like the NBA. If you get the NBA game ball in the stands, you got to give it back. And you don't get anything signed. You get the ball, you hand it back, and you have a good story to tell your friends. Hey, did you see me on TV? In baseball, you get a ball, you get a bat, a glove, anything. It's yours. So she catches the ball. What you do 
So I want to remind people what goes on pregame. There was something in the uh, on Twitter showing the Oakland A's had a pregame piece of paper which talked about how many people were going to be in the stands. It talked about what the rules are and what the giveaways are. Very normal. It's called the game report. The game report is shared with game day employees. It's shared with the concessionaire. It's shared with the operations people. It's shared with the clubhouses. It's shared with the umpires. So whenever people say, oh, the umpires didn't know that there was a chance for a 600th home run, it's horse hockey. Of course they do. So the game report every day for the Dodgers would include the fact that Otani had not hit a home run yet and that a first home run could be hit that day. So we would let umpires know and opposing teams know, and we'd let game day ops know that, hey, there's a bunch of players. Here's what could happen. They could get their first hit. They could get their first home run. These are all balls you want to try to get back. First hits are received back from players, which is why you need the managers to know what's happening. First home runs, if they're hit where fans are, you want them back from the fans. So the game day operations and security people have to know because what you do is once a ball is hit and it's Otani's first home run, then security will go get the person, bring the person down into the tunnel and bring them to me because I am going to try to get that ball back for Shohei Otani. Everything here is standard. Then the Dodgers somehow, for whatever reason, Ms. Roman gets the ball. And strangely, the Dodgers and their security, according to her husband, did not play very nicely with her. Separated her from her husband. Threatened to refuse to authenticate the ball if she didn't cut a deal to give the ball back to Otani. Explained that if we don't authenticate the ball, then you have no proof that it was the ball and you won't be able to get a penny for it. Truth is an affirmative defense for all you lawyers out there listening or watching live on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. I want to just do a quick side story here, Coca, about authentication. There are some balls that are pre-authenticated. When a ball is used for each row's 3,000th hit, they were numbered for Mark McGuire's record-breaking home run or Barry Bonds. They're actually numbered. And so when someone gets the ball, there is a number on it, and it is known that that was the number. But there are also MLB-paid authenticators at every game. Those are the people who are in the dugout. They're also in the back in the clubhouse. They can go to the visiting clubhouse. They are everywhere. They've got all these little silver stickers that have numbers on them. It's like almost a QR code. You stick the sticker on an item, and then you enter into the computer what the item was. Broken bat from fourth inning on April 4th, 2024, off the bat of Mookie Betts, off the pitcher, John Cocktoston. So you can go online and see exactly what your piece of memorabilia is. The funny part is that in advance of a game, the authenticator also knows we're not authenticating regular foul balls that go into the stands. Hey, I caught a foul ball. You take it home. Great. No problem. Not authenticated. You can tell people that you caught it directly. You can tell people it hit the person in front of you's face, and then you grabbed it. You can tell people you, you stole it from a little kid. You can do whatever you want. A ball that Otani hits for his first home run or any important ball we take it immediately to get authenticated. Prior to any negotiation to get that ball back, the first thing that happens is the authenticator meets to get the ball. If the authenticator did not authenticate Otani's first home run ball prior to one word being spoken to Ms. Roman, then the Dodgers were doing something out of the ordinary and out of step with what should be done. Next. Totally normal to try to exchange one piece of memorabilia for another. Give me the ball back. We'll give you a picture, a meet and greet, a hat, a different sign ball. We'll give you a bat. Shohei Otani in the clubhouse in LA has five to 10 boxes of his bats. 
multiple gloves, though players don't like giving gloves. Multiple pairs of spikes, sometimes players do like giving spikes. Batting gloves, helmets, signing an extra ball, everything that you could have. This woman decided that she would give the ball for two signed hats, a signed ball, and a signed bat. That is a great trait. Except her husband, it turns out, was not very happy with that trade and claims that he was not with her when she agreed to that trade. I didn't understand what that meant. Is the husband claiming that the Dodgers escorted her from the stands and she wasn't allowed for the person she was with to come with her? Because that's got to be total horse hockey. Because if the Dodgers actually did that, it is a violation of what you do when you have someone who has a piece of memorabilia that you want. You don't just bring the person because then the person has anxiety about not being with whoever they're with, whether it's their kids, their husband, their employer, their friends. We would bring the group down. Now, do we have the group meet Otani? Likely not. We cut the deal with solely the person who has the ball. But if it's a husband and wife, we're definitely not separating the husband and wife trying to somehow get the wife to agree to a unbalanced deal. I'd like to believe the Dodgers didn't do that. Because if they did, it means that they are way, way worse than anybody else. So I don't ever want to believe that. But her husband, and we should try to talk to Alexis Valenzuela if we can find him, they really took advantage of her. There was a bunch of security guys around her. They wouldn't let me talk to her, give her any advice. There was no way for us to leave. They had her cornered in the back. I'm hoping that's a bit of hyperbole. But this is all the appetizer, the appetizer to the main event. The main event is the confusion that exists around, did Shohei Otani meet Amber, Ambar Roman? Let me explain why this matters. A, Otani's credibility is very much in question, given that he may or may not have gambled. We hope he didn't. He's saying that he had no idea that money was taken from his account. We need him to be telling the truth. Baseball needs him. The fans need him. The Dodgers need him. We need him to be the pillar of truth-telling. Otani apparently said that I was able to talk to the fan and was able to get it back. It's a special ball, a lot of feelings toward it. I'm very grateful that it's back. Except Roman said, I never met the guy. Well, wait a minute. Is Otani lying? So now we have a dispute of who said what in a true he said, she said, except it's a he squared said, she said. And the he squared is that the interpreter is involved. Shockingly, the new interpreter is Will Ireton. The interpreter is where we got that Otani said I was able to talk to the fan. But there are some people believe it was lost in translation and that Otani did not say I was able to speak to the fan. He said that the fan was spoken to through me, meaning I had a representative speak to the fan. Let me try to clarify how it works. There is no scenario under which we would ever do a trade with a person that doesn't include the player coming out, thanking the fan for getting the ball back to the player for a first hit, first home run. It'd more be like a first home run, a milestone home run. We offer and tell the player, come out, you shake a hand, you take a photo, you present the signed ball, the signed jersey, whatever you're going to trade. It is a total, and we tell the player this, it will not be more than 60 seconds. It's not a meet and greet. You're not having lunch. You're not having a conversation about your family, your friends, or your previous 14 at-bats. You are presenting an item, and this is for any player, whether you're a rookie or a star. If the player wants to stay and have a conversation, up to them. But we tell the player, 60 seconds at most, you give, you get, arm, click, done. The fact that this ex issue 
exists with the Dodgers and they didn't clear it up is completely absurd. As a matter of fact, they are declining to even comment on what the husband is saying and what the wife is saying. I have a solution for the Dodgers. I would like them to go into a period of the next six months through October, assuming they win the World Series. I would like them to go into a period of straight honesty because it is so important that we believe them now and Otani has to do the same thing. And to do it, we need Otani's interpreter to be pitch perfect. We need there to never be a way that we don't know what Otani is saying. And this is not splitting the atom, folks. You can find interpreters who are able to interpret everything. Now, interpreting, two-minute side note, Coca, I've told you my funniest Ichiro story of all time, which is we asked Ichiro a question. Ichiro spoke for 10 minutes. It was really three minutes, and the interpreter just said yes. And I kept saying, are you sure? And then Ichiro would speak again, and then the interpreter would say yes. However, that was not a conversation about something as important as getting a 3,000th hit back. It was about Ichiro's willingness to come off the bench, to not be an everyday player. And we didn't care much more than him saying yes, because while he may have caveats, he may have reasons that he wants to play more, he may be telling us a story that we don't understand. We just needed to check the box that we had and we could tell the media, told Ichiro what his role would be in case something bad ever came up. With Otani, it is the same thing, but on steroids. <sighs> I wonder how this ends. This ends with the Dodgers having to comment because this is not going to go away with whether or not Otani was t telling the truth or not about did he meet her. So we're going to find out. I'm pretty excited to find this out because it matters. <laughs> For baseball, they certainly hope that it was an interpreter mistake. Maybe they'll fire that interpreter too. All right, when we come back, I'm going to review a movie that is uh, a very important watch that I got from Coca. And then we're going to talk about what's going on with injuries and pitchers and something that the Marlins are going through that your favorite team goes through every day as well. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Thank you for joining us every Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. Eastern, no matter where I am. And we're on DraftKings Network. We're on YouTube. So please keep telling your friends about us. I also want to have you please go right now, if you're listening to this, on another device to davidsampsonpodcast.com, not just for the merch that I'm wearing, but also for updates on our tour. We will be in Atlanta this coming Oh, I love that you crossed out Philly. That's funny. We will be in Atlanta this coming Monday and Boston this coming Wednesday. I have to put my glasses on to say Boston, Massachusetts. I hope so. Yes, it does. Atlanta on the 8th, Boston on the 10th. We will have a lot of fun. Go to the website and you can get tickets there. Looking forward to seeing you. Coca called me and asked me to watch a movie called The Lionheart. It's on Max. It's a documentary about a indie driver who unfortunately dies in a crash in Las Vegas. And you're going to say that's a spoiler alert, except it's not. And that's not the part of the movie I want to discuss. A, the documentary is outstanding. Let me get it out of the way. Go watch it. But B, what do you do as parents when your kids want to do something that costs the life of their father, or when your kids want to go into a dangerous job. This documentary is really about the widow, the mother, and about the fact that the two living children who were very young when their dad died are now getting into indie racing. Now, of course, when you're kids, it starts as go-karts, but that's how it all starts. And then it becomes indie car racing. And these kids are good. What would you do? That's all I kept thinking about. How, as a parent, do you not let your kids chase their dreams 
in a industry that of course has risk. Does that mean you don't want your child to be an airline pilot? Or you don't want your child to ever to wash windows on a skyscraper? There's so many jobs that are inherently dangerous. How about the trapeze families? That's what I kept thinking about. Or evil Knievel with his son being a daredevil. Are there some jobs that are just way more dangerous than others that you would tell your kids just don't do it? Think about the Earnhardt family. There's so many examples where there have been deaths for things that have happened, and yet parents are okay with their kids doing it. And it just got me thinking. So when you're watching The Lionheart, please think of it in those terms. What would you do for your children? Do you keep the memory alive of their father by having them in the same business? The emotionality of the children going back to Vegas where their father died and racing in the same venue, it was quite something. What's worse than an 0-8 start to the season? I never wanted to be the last team that was winless. I'm almost positive I've never been that. Always wanted to get your first victory. It's so important. People in Miami are talking about the fact that the Marlins are 0-8. They're talking about they haven't. It's the worst week, total hyperbole, in franchise history. Maybe other than when Jose passed away. Maybe other than when we had a trade and break down the team in 05 and 12. Or how about 97 when I wasn't there? 0-8 oh, isn't great. Even the Mets won a game in front of 69 people yesterday. But the biggest news out of Miami has to do with another young superstar, Yuri Perez, having Tommy John surgery. Another example of a team that was not forthcoming with you about his injury. Remember, he's got the blister. He's got a little forearm tightness. Everything's good. Don't need surgery. And then all of a sudden, Tommy John, out of nowhere, announced. They had to send their new GM, president of baseball ops, chief baseball officer, whatever you want to call it, the new whiz from the Tampa Bay Rays. They had to send him out, Peter Bendix, and they had to have him say a quote. There was an understanding that the ligament was not in great shape, and essentially you can pitch with it until you can't, and nobody knows when that's going to be. You have to try and see when the symptoms return. And unfortunately, that happened now, better now than in the middle of the season. So I'll give Peter one little pass because he's never had to comment on this before. He's never been the one in charge. But in terms of when you're giving quotes about your players, I like to say that I always would prefer players to get Tommy John earlier the minute they've got the inflammation, the minute they've got the tightness, the minute, because I know what it's leading to. And the sooner you do Tommy John, the sooner the player can come back. So having it done now, early April, there is a chance with a 12-month recovery that he can pitch in 2025, but it's more likely with his age and his upside that they'll wait really till closer to the All-Star break in 2025. The thing is, though, when your team doctor talks to you and says that the ligament's not in great shape, but let him pitch until he can't, the player is involved in that decision. And the player always wants to try to pitch through it because any pre-arbitration player does not want to miss a year of their arbitration year of their pre-arbitration years without getting any stats and being on the injury list for a year. Because when he goes to arbitration, which Yuri Perez certainly thinks through his agent that he would because of the quality of the arm, you want performance and you want bulk. You want wins, you want innings pitched, you want strikeouts. Always better to have Tommy John after you sign a free agent deal or in the minor leagues. Remember, I'm the one who went public and saying, I'd like to give Tommy John surgery to every one of my minor league pitchers because I don't want to lose productive, cheap years of my best pitchers to Tommy John. And that's what's happening with the Marlins. An entire year of him at the minimum is now gone. So what did I expect Peter to say? When you are running a team and you know that your best player is going to be added to the list of Tommy Johns, you can have 
30 minutes of emotion, 30 minutes of upset. But then you've got to spring into action as a leader of your team, and you've got to look at the realistic year that you are having. And I don't mean because you're 0-7 at the time. I mean because you know with the team you've put together that it is not an October team. You want Yuri Perez to get the Tommy John surgery, and then you want to start moving your veterans like Ken Rosenthal talked about. And what we talked about yesterday with teams knowing where they are before the season even starts, knowing what their plan is. When I had pitchers with inflammation, it's not really inflammation. We get the MRI. We know exactly what it is. We don't need to tell the media and the fans the truth. We can lie and say it's a blister. We can lie and say he's going to be fine. But what you hope for your front office is that they're acting as though they know the truth from the beginning and they act accordingly. So don't conflate what's said to the media versus the actual internal preparations. And what would worry me if I were a Marlins fan is, did the front office actually believe that we're just going to let him go until the ligament falls out? Till the ligament tears? But it's already torn. You know this from the MRI. You know that the player is not going to be able to make it because it is the rare exception that a player can play through and it's a long term of playing through, like a Tanaka. The Marlins have players missing Tommy John, the former Cy Young player, Sandy Alcantara. He's making $9 million this season, not to pitch. $17 million next year, coming off Tommy John. The Marlins are an organization where they've got to make tough decisions. But I wanted to take two quick minutes with you, two minutes of our show. And again, make a plea to all executives out there. Long-term contracts, be careful. Pitchers who have not had Tommy John, who have deliveries, who are throwing in the upper 90s, the arm action that is required for the velocity that is required of our players indicates that long-term health is unlikely because it's not natural what these pitchers are doing. Therefore, collect pitching, collect players who your fans haven't heard of. It's okay. You want to be the Rays, be the Rays. You've got to have depth and you've got to save your powder, save your money because the pitchers need to be interchangeable. This public service announcement brought to you by someone who has seen pitching injuries than the average person, who has spent more years running a team than the average person, and it's not getting better. Baseball is going to come out and say, we're studying it. We're trying to make it so there's injuries. When we crave velocity, we are inviting injury. Nothing personal pick of the day. Pablo Lopez did not have it last night. We had the Twins beating the Guardians, and we are now 39 and 46. Quite disappointing, I should say. My start to the baseball season has been less than exemplary. But the good news is, it's a long way to go. We are seven games under 500. I'm going away from baseball because I am solely focused today. Not solely focused. I don't like when I say that, especially because my focus is everywhere. Women's Final Four is today. We've got Caitlin Clark. We've got NC State. We've got Purdue. We've got UConn. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Men's Final Four is this weekend. Women's Final Four today. NC State and UConn are both the women's and the men's. We've got South Carolina favored to win the women's tournament. Coke and I had a major, major discussion last night on why Caitlin Clark is not favored to win the most extraordinary player, the MVP of the tournament. I have no idea why anyone from South Carolina, even if they win the entire tournament, would win it, given what Caitlin Clark has done. But in order to win picks of the day, I want it to be very clear. I want Caitlin Clark over five and a half threes. And we're only giving 125 for that. That seems like a give me knock wood. It's the worst thing to say when you're doing a pick. But Caitlin Clark over five and a half threes. That's my pick. I think I will win the game too. It's very important that Iowa wins the game. 
Let's talk about men's final four coming Saturday. NC State, such big spreads. NC State is getting nine versus Purdue. Alabama is getting 11 and a half versus UConn. I'm going to have to stick with NC State because I said on the Rich Eisen show that I think NC State could win the whole tournament. Now, of course, Purdue's favored by nine, but we're going to take the points. NC State plus nine versus Purdue on Saturday. And we're going to give the points in the UConn game as our third pick of the weekend. UConn giving 11 and a half to Alabama, which could set up still a UConn-Purdue final because Purdue could win but not cover. Or it could set up a UConn-NC State final if NC State does more than just cover. Which gets me to my last half-unit suggested wager today. I'm going to take UConn and NC State on the money line. And we get plus 398 for that. If NC State upsets Purdue and UConn does what they're supposed to do, that is almost four to one. So those are our picks of the weekend. And we'll get back to baseball picks next week. Although Monday, we're going to give you a final pick for the final game. But we will definitely get back to some baseball picks because I got to win some. I want to end the week on a story that affected me. I mean, it not, it didn't ruin my day, didn't change my life. But did you read what's going on in New York? And I'm not the guy who thinks New York is the center of the world as much as I love Saul Steinberg. I just think that when things happen in New York, it can sometimes be a reflection of things that are happening everywhere else, regardless of red versus blue. I'm talking about New York. I'm talking about the New York Marathon. I don't often talk about the New York Marathon when it's not November. And I do have marathon on my brain, given that I'm trying to run the London Marathon in two weeks. But did you read and about 89 point, no more, 92 or 94% of you may not have read this because you're not in New York. Thank you. The New York Roadrunners Club got notified by the Transit Authority in New York that they owed $750,000 for tolls on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Now, you may be saying, David, what am I talking about? I don't get what you're saying. The New York Marathon, New York's an island. Let's start with that, Manhattan. And the New York Marathon goes through all the boroughs of New York, of which Staten Island is one. The marathon starts on one side of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and all of the 50,000 runners run across it. What the Transit Authority was saying is, hey, listen, we want you to pay the tolls. And I thought to myself, you mean because people, when they're walking across the bridge or running across the bridge, have to pay a toll? No. They're saying that's missed revenue because we shut the bridge down for your marathon. And therefore, we're losing out on like 750 grand. So just pay us the money as though the bridge is still open. And the New York Roadrunners Club said, well, what? That can't be true. And then I realized this is all about public financing. The New York Roadrunners Club is a private organization. The Boston Athletic Association, private organization. And what the MTA was saying is, hey, we're a public entity. We don't want to give you a tax break, a toll break. We don't want to give you free police coverage. That's not the MTA. That's New York and all the different boroughs, New York Police Department but we want you to pay. And so guess what? The MTA said, are you out of your mind? Of course we're not paying that because that would require us to increase the fees that the marathon runners pay to a point that they won't be able to afford it and they won't do it. And two, it's just patently offensive and ridiculous because of the economic development that we give you by having the New York Marathon. And it turns out that it's the same economic development argument that Everybody does when they're trying to get finance for their stadium or their business or anything else. So, of course, how does the story end? Like it's Buffalo. Governor Kathy Hochul had to step up and say, you know what? The MTA, they went rogue. New York Roadrunners, you don't have to pay the 750 grand. It's totally absurd. And MTA looked at Kathy and said, Governor, come on. It's business. And then the governor looked at the roadrunners and said, hey, 
it's nothing personal.